The route that I think has the greatest potential to develop fast train service at the lowest cost is the Chicago-St. Louis corridor. That's a corridor that is by and large rural and where trains can pick up speeds to 110 miles an hour and we can bring down the travel time between St. Louis and Chicago. Good morning. I think I'm in church here. Thank you so quiet. <laughs> what a beautiful facility and what a beautiful day. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Paul Serpa. I am the executive director of the Hispanic American construction industry. HACIA is a 30-year-old advocacy organization which promotes Hispanics, minorities, and women in the overall public and private participation within our actual industry. We welcome each and every one of you here today to our symposium, making the case for high-speed rail. Now, you may ask yourself, why, in fact, are we trying to make the case for high-speed rail? Well, HACIA, in its attempts to fully assess all of the benefits of the stimulus package, we took a strong look with regards to how it would impact our industry directly. And we found, obviously, that a majority portion of it was providing for added infrastructure opportunities with its focus on roads, bridges, and transit. So then we began to ask ourselves, whether there are any other possible opportunities that perhaps may not have been being explored. And to that end, we started digging deeper, and we realized that part of the stimulus package, President Obama called for a new network of high-speed rail, uh, a vision which would connect the country's major population center from coast to coast. Such a project would be funded through the stimulus plan that he signed into law back in February. $8 billion of which, which had been allocated for high-speed rail. Now, while Europe and Japan have embraced this kind of mass transit, the U.S., unfortunately, has lagged largely behind. To date, federal investment dollars in inner-city rail transit has amounted to only a few billion dollars per year, as compared to a bit less than $60 billion per year for highway funding. Currently, there is only one high-speed rail corridor in the country, and that's Amtrak's Acela Line, which runs from Washington, D.C. to Boston, which is capable of traveling 150 miles per hour. In this new network of high-speed rail to be considered, a hub of lines would extend from Chicago as far west as to Kansas City and as far east to Cleveland. On the west coast, a line would link San Diego to San Francisco and a track would run from Portland, Oregon to Vancouver, British Columbia. In Texas, Austin would be linked to Oklahoma City and Tulsa, and a line would run across the southeast from Washington, D.C. to Atlanta, and further south to Jacksonville, Florida. Of all the building and construction funding derived from the economic stimulus package, high-speed rail is probably one of the most big-picture agendas for the future. Now, arguably, some may indicate that it wouldn't necessarily have the immediate and affordable housing or energy efficiency in retrofitting our schools. Perhaps, but its long-term payoff merits some serious consideration. Better high-speed rail networks will increase the development of sustainably dense mass transit design neighborhoods at an urban scale that exists today in America. And true enough, the success of the plan will rest on the government's public relations efforts to convince the people who don't live near city centers that high-speed rail is, in fact, a worthy investment. Now, in my researching of high-speed rail concepts and funding, details by the president uh, on the internet, one blogger was noted as saying that perhaps the president was channeling a fellow Chicagoan, Daniel Burnham. Uh, I don't know if he has that specific talent, however, though, as you all know, Daniel Burnham made, is famous for the statement of making no little plans. When President Obama announced his vision, perhaps maybe that's exactly what he was doing. In his announcement, he indicated that a proposal would lead towards a number of innovations in how we travel in America. 
In addition, high-speed rail would establish thousands of construction jobs for several years and permanent jobs for rail employees and the communities in which they serve. Now, he also indicated that high-speed rail is long overdue. Now, when we think about that statement, we have to think back to many years ago. Obviously, the transition from mass train travel to individual ownership was also seen as a historic legacy of American ingenuity, um, as there's no question that it was definitely a movement forward for our nation when it was completed in the middle of the 20th century. Since then, many Americans have viewed interstate rail travel as a piece of our past, which perhaps may not fit in the present methods of travel options. Some may also view rail travel as an obsolete portion of Americana, which is only being kept alive by government subsidies, even though the carbon-consuming qualities of cars are coming into focus more painfully each and every day. If the Obama administration, the Department of Transportation, and perhaps a few clever engineers, architects, and contractors can make the case that a step back into rail is really a move forward, then we will have carved out a space for economic and industrial revisionism that will go a long way towards providing opportunities and thousands of jobs while also making our economy conform to the requirements of the contemporary sustainability movement. Therefore, today, we hope that our symposiums will help you all in understanding the case for high-speed rail. We have a, a wonderful panel of experts and the most distinguished and honored members from government to have here before you today. Uh, we're most appreciative and excited to be able to present all of them to you this morning. And once again, thank you all for participating. Uh, so with that in mind, I'd like to begin the introductions of our panel members and members of our dais here today. To my far left, uh, we are awaiting the arrival of Mr. Ray Lang from Amtrak. Uh, on the, my very far left, we have Illinois Department of Transportation Secretary, Mr. Gary Hanick. <laughs> to his right, we have Mr. J.D. Stokes, one of our Hacienda members and Vice President of SE3 LLC. <laughs> Seated next to Mr. Stokes, we have Mr. Jose Luis Birseño, the Director of Industry and Infrastructure from the Trade Commercial Office of Spain. My immediate right, um, unfortunately, the governor cannot be with us here this morning. Uh, he has been called to a meeting with President Obama. We'll excuse him. We have with us, we have with us however, though, a good friend of Hacia and certainly uh, well-known within uh, Illinois State Government, Mr. Jack Levin, the CEO from the Governor's Office. <laughs> to his right, uh, certainly a champion uh, as of late there within the last session here, and certainly s some interesting uh, pieces of legislation in which provided insulation to minority-owned businesses as well. We have Mr. Illin the Illinois State Senator and the Chair of the Transportation Committee, the Honorable Martin A. Sandoval. And with that in mind, we'd like to present to all of you here um, our keynote speaker, Senator Richard Durbin. <laughs> so Now, Senator Durbin was elected by his fellow Democratic Senators in December 2006 to the post of Assistant Majority Leader, also known as the Majority Whip. It is the Senate's second highest ranking position. Senator Durbin's election to leadership marked only the fifth time in history that an Illinois Senator has served as a Senate leader. Senator Durbin, a Democrat from Springfield, is the 47th Senator from the state of Illinois and the first Illinois Senator to serve on the U.S. Senate Appropriations Committee in more than a quarter century. He is the state's senior senator and convener of bipartisan Illinois delegation. Elected to the U.S. Senate on November of 1996 and re-elected in 2002, 
Senator Durbin fills the seat left vacant by the retirement of his longtime friend and mentor, U.S. Senator Paul Simon. In 2001, Senate Democratic leader Tom Daschle appointed Durbin to the Senate's leadership team and assistant Democratic floor leader. In 2000, Senator Durbin served as a co-chairman of the Democratic Platform Committee and also was co-chairman of the Atlantic Conference sponsored by the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations. He is a founding member of the Senate Global AIDS Caucus. Senator Durbin also is the House author of landmark legislation to ban smoking on commercial airlines and has worked in the Senate to protect children from the harm caused by tobacco. For his work, he was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Lung Association. Among his other health achievements, Durbin has worked successfully for increased federal funding to prevent childhood asthma, increased immunizations, and expanded medical research. He has successfully fought to increase the share of federal funding dedicated to combating AIDS worldwide. In 1999, Durbin was honored as the American Public Health Association's Legislator of the Year, and in 2001, he received the American Medal Association's Dr. Nathan Davis Award for Outstanding Government Service. Senator Durbin also is a champion of consumer protection, which was high on Durbin's list of priorities, continuing in an effort spurred by a meeting with the mother of a Chicago six-year-old who died after eating a contaminated hamburger. Durbin led an effort to modernize the fragmented federal food safety system under a single food safety agency. Senator Durbin has also led an effort to ban ephedra, a dangerous product sold as a nutritional supplement and has introduced legislation to require manufacturers of other dietary supplements to ensure their products are safe before they're sold. Senator Durbin has also worked for gun safety legislation to keep guns out of the hands of children, introducing bipartisan legislation to hold adults responsible if they fail to lock up their firearms and weapons and are subsequently taken by a child used to kill another person. Lastly, Senator Durbin's tax cut agenda includes tax credits for small businesses, buying health insurance for low-income workers, estate tax relief for family-owned small businesses and farms, tax incentives to promote charitable giving, and tax credits for long-term care insurance, child care, and college tuition. Please join me in welcoming our U.S. Senator from Illinois, Dick Durbin. Thank you very much, Paul Serpa. It is great to be at the University Club, although I have to tell you, every time I walk in this room, I get nervous. <laughs> My chief of staff, Mike Daly, will remember, it was about 20 years ago, I was a downstate congressman, and a Chicago businessman had an idea to build a coal gasification plant just a few miles from my home. Big deal. And he said, can you come up to Chicago? I'd like to meet with you and talk about my plans. And I said, sure. Well, let's have lunch, he said. I said, well, sure. He said, I'll meet you at the University Club. So I came into this room, dazzled by the beautiful view of Lake Michigan and this ornate room with all the stained glass. And we sat down and we had lunch. And it was all over. The waiter came over and put the check on the table. And I kind of waited, and he kind of waited. <laughs> I kind of waited, and he kind of waited. And I said, uh, are you a member of this club? And he said, no, aren't you? I said, no. <laughs> so, somehow or another, we worked it out, and I didn't have to wash dishes. But I, every time I walk in here, I'll never forget that story. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Victor Jakowitz with uh, Hasia, Ray Fernandez, and uh, Louis, Louis Collado. Um, there, for those who are here with Hasia, thank you for the vision of this uh, meeting. But I just want to spend 60 seconds to reflect on a loss that we all suffered recently when one of the real pioneers of uh, Hispanic American business and leadership in Chicago passed away, Arturo Velasquez, an amazing man, lived to be in his 90s. When he came to this city, there were very, very few Spanish-speaking. In fact, at one point, his mother was despondent and left and was headed back to Mexico and somehow got stopped in New Mexico and then took an offer to go become a migrant fruit picker and went up and did some more and finally made it back to Chicago. That's where Art was raised. 
an incredible man who uh, really was one of the pioneers in the city of Chicago. He left such a legacy, and Hasia is part of that legacy, but equally important, he left the legacy of a magnificent, wonderful family. Not only business leaders and civic leaders, uh, his daughter Carmen Velasquez uh, has uh, clinics, the Alivio clinics that I visit frequently whenever I need a charge to, to see what good things are going on every day to help those who are struggling in the Chicago community. So, Hasia, if you continue in the tradition of Arturo Velasquez, you will continue to be a great organization. And I thank you for being here and inviting me. <clears throat> Senator Martin Sal Sandoval, glad you're here. And Gary Hannig, a friend of mine from my neck of the woods, 200 miles south of here, and now our Illinois Secretary of Transportation. And uh, Jack, I don't know what your current Chief Operating Officer is, his current title, I had to keep up with it. But Jack Lavin's done a great job. I've worked with him in Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. And allow me to digress for another 60 seconds about uh, our Governor, Pat Quinn. I can't think of a Governor in recent memory who inherited a bigger challenge than Pat Quinn. Uh, not only the scandal that preceded his ascension from lieutenant governor to governor, but also a budget and fiscal crisis the likes of which this state has never seen. A debt of over $11 billion, and though we're doing some part to help by sending $4 billion from Washington, the lion's share of this burden is going to fall on his shoulders and the shoulders of the General Assembly and ultimately the shoulders of all of us who live in the state of Illinois. I came out early in support of Pat Quinn's proposal, not because it was a popular thing to do. I can read the paper. People hate taxes by a margin of about three to one. But Pat Quinn is honest. He is telling us a true story about what we face, and I just admire his leadership. And I'm glad that he is in the governor's uh, chair. I think he has shown uh, a commitment to this state throughout his public career, and I wish him the very best, and I hope, Gary, you'll pass that word along to him, uh, and Jack, when you see him. I think he's doing an extraordinary job. Let me say a word about railroads. Someone came up to me here earlier and said, I didn't realize you were from a railroad family. I said, well, I would say so. My father, my mother, my two brothers and I all worked for the New York Central Railroad in East St. Louis, Illinois. If you know anything about railroads, uh, East St. Louis is a railroad town <laughs> surrounded by railroad towns. It has to do with getting across that river and the few bridges that were available. So most of the railroad yards were on the Illinois side of the river. And the New York Central, that was their western terminus. And uh, if you went down to St. Louis and stood in the arch and looked directly across at the Casino Queen, the uh, riverboat down there, that's where we used to have the office building for the New York Central Railroad. It was a big red brick building and a big part of my life, as railroads have been. I spent summers working as a bill clerk in that building, watching them build the St. Louis Arch, and summers out in Brooklyn, Illinois, which is nearby, as a bill clerk working out in the railroad yard. So, yeah, I'll have to tell you, a little bit of this is in my blood. My dad used to be able to travel for, because he worked for the railroad, on passenger trains for a penny a mile. That's what, originally they had free passes, but in his day it was a penny a mile. And he and I took the train from St. Louis to Los Angeles for my brother's wedding, uh, taking the uh, Missouri Pacific to Kansas City and then the uh, El Capitan, uh, Santa Fe, from Kansas City to uh, Los Angeles. It was part of my youth and part of growing up, and I guess part of the reason that I'm here. I never got it out of my mind and out of my blood. It's amazing when you look at the history of Amtrak and consider all the consolidation of railroads over the years. Um, when I grew up, the New York Central, uh, railroad, its fiercest competitor was the Pennsylvania Railroad. And I remember as a little kid being bored to tears as my mom and dad would talk about those terrible people who worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad <laughs> over my dinner table. And I couldn't believe it. And they said, and then your Aunt Della married a guy who worked for the Pennsylvania. Can you believe this? I didn't know what that meant. And then eventually the day came when it became Penn Central, Jim. And my mom was about to die to think that she was actually going to have to work for part of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, so that's, that's what I grew up with. But Amtrak, which ultimately came out as a product of all those consolidations and the abandonment of passenger rail, was the federal government's attempt to try to keep passenger rail alive. And it almost failed. If you look back 
at the meager funding for Amtrak over the last 20 or 25 years, it's a wonder that we can even talk about it today. There were moments in time when presidents sent no money to Amtrak for capital improvement, for the things that they needed, and then complained bitterly when Amtrak needed a federal subsidy, while well, we all realize that virtually every form of transportation has a federal subsidy. And Amtrak, somehow or another, managed to cling to life. It was probably because the Northeast Corridor, and it was such an important part of the Northeast economy. Across the country, Amtrak service shrunk dramatically over the years because there was no investment in it. People were in love with their cars. We were building highways and interstates. We were serving the needs of the public in their automobiles and virtually ignoring that vestige of American history, passenger rail. And that's about where it would have been and maybe would have resulted in Amtrak disappearing, but for $4 a gallon gasoline. And at that point in time, America started looking around for affordable alternatives to travel. And they found and refound Amtrak. Fortunately, here in the state of Illinois, we had made an earlier decision to invest $25 million a year in our Amtrak service, expanding that rail service from Chicago beyond the traditional routes to new routes that really started to take off. Quincy, Chicago is an example of it. More trains on the St. Louis, Chicago run, and of course the city of New Orleans and those trains that run down to Carbondale. More and more service coming out of the state subsidy. So the state was doing what the federal government didn't do. And it paid off as we put more trains in service, had a better schedule, more reliability, more and more people flocked to Amtrak. And then with $4 gasoline, you needed a reservation. You better not show up looking to get us, uh, on board uh, for a ticket if you hadn't called ahead or got on the in internet and made a reservation to get on Amtrak. It was a dramatic change. And it showed that there was a potential and people would get out of their cars and get into Amtrak trains to come to Chicago or head down to St. Louis or all points in between. Then along came this president, Barack Obama. And Barack Obama had never discussed this with me at all. We'd never had a conversation about high-speed rail. But in the midst of our debate about the Recovery and Reinvestment Act to put this economy back on its feet, we get word that the president wants to invest $8 billion in high-speed rail across the United States. I couldn't have been happier. I'm not sure where it came from, who inspired him to ask for it, but it really changed the debate dramatically. And that wasn't the end of it. He says, beyond the $8 billion that will go into the Recovery Act, another $5 billion over the next several years, pumped into building high-speed rail corridors across the United States. It's no wonder that a president from Illinois would have a vision for railroads. If you're a student of history, you know that the only reason we built the Transcontinental Railroad when we did was because Abraham Lincoln, then president of the United States, had a Congress that had been uh, devastated by the Civil War with all the Southerners leaving so that he could envision a transcontinental railroad project and not have to fight the issue of slavery on that bill. All the Southerners had gone. The Civil War had started. So Abraham Lincoln said, we're going to build the transcontinental railroad. Now comes Barack Obama and talks about his vision about rail and our future. Now, there are a lot of proposals. I've talked to Jim Oberstar, who's chairman of the House Public Works Committee. And of course, his vision involves uh, Minneapolis and Madison and Chicago. Others have ideas about Chicago to Detroit service, Chicago Milwaukee service. I basically told them I'm on board for any one of these routes that has the word Chicago in it. I want to talk to anybody who wants to expand service as long as Chicago is part of it. But the route that I think has the greatest potential to develop fast train service at the lowest cost is the Chicago-St. Louis corridor. That's a corridor that is by and large rural and where trains can pick up speeds to 110 miles an hour and we can bring down the travel time between St. Louis and Chicago. Gary and I were down in St. Louis just a few weeks ago. Uh, we had met with the Union Pacific Railroad and I want to commend Gary Hannig and Governor Quinn again. They sat down and developed a memorandum of understanding because they own most of the trackage between St. Louis and Chicago. What we're trying to do here, my friends, for those of you who are not from Illinois or Chicago, is to make it clear that we want to win this on the merits. We want to be ahead of every other corridor in America in preparing ourselves for this new high-speed rail investment. And so Gary worked with the Union Pacific Railroad for a memorandum of understanding. I initiated a letter signed by virtually all of the senators from the Midwest to the President. 
We had letters signed. Governor Quinn circulated a letter to the governors from the Midwest. Our goal is to look to the day when we not only talk about the Northeast Corridor, but we talk about the Midwest High Speed Corridor. This is a reality that can occur if we work on it to make it happen. I want to commend this, the state of Illinois. It took a long time, but finally, they're passing a capital bill and sending it to the governor, who I hope will sign it soon if he works out some of his other issues. And in that capital bill are substantial investments, $150 million into Amtrak and through the uh, work of the governor and Elaine Neckritz, for example, state representative who's really been a leader on this issue, another $400 million for high-speed rail corridor here in the state of Illinois. I argued to the governor and others, it's pretty hard for me to ask for federal money if we don't put some of our state money into this investment. And so the capital bill has this dramatic investment. Part of this as well is going to be focused on CREATE. Now those of you who live in the Chicago area know what this is all about. Former uh, Congressman Bill Lipinski initiated this program to find ways to divert railroad traffic and to find ways to reduce the congestion that we, that we have in the city and around the city of Chicago. So CREATE is part of this investment as well. One other point I would like to make to you, and that is that um, it, 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 I am not anti-trade. I certainly don't have any bias against Canada or even Europe, but the notion that we would have to buy all of our train sets from some other foreign country bothers me. We've got a lot of auto workers who've just lost their jobs. We've got a lot of manufacturing that is disappearing from our state. Why in the world don't we, and I'll be parochial for those of us from Illinois, why don't we in Illinois reclaim that title to build the trains of the future? There's no reason why we can't do that. We have the skill to do it. We need to have the investment to make it happen, but we know the demand's going to be there. Current Amtrak trains are about 30 years old, the ones you see on the tracks today. You know, they're keeping them together. They're okay. I travel on them regularly. But we can do a lot better. Go over to Spain or to France or other countries and look at what they're traveling in. We can do a lot better, and a newer train is going to attract more and more passengers. So we're working to make that happen. Not just the cars, but also the engines. One of the more exciting producers of uh, diesel engines happens to be based in Illinois. Their home base of operations is Mount Vernon downstate, but they have two other production facilities in Silvis and in the Chicagoland area, and uh, another one uh, out of state. They are developing a new generation of diesel engine that is being sold around the world that has 50% more fuel efficiency than current diesel engines and an 80% reduction in particulate matter and emissions being built right here in our state. It, in my mind, it's inspiring to me that we ought to build on that. And I've talked to uh, several people in Washington about that. I'll close by saying that uh, we have a great team in Washington following this and every one of them can find Illinois. Ray LaHood, former congressman from Peoria, is Secretary of Transportation. Tom Carper, former mayor of Galesburg, whom I commended to the president and was appointed now as chairman of the Amtrak board. Joe Zabo, former switching clerk for the um, Illinois Central Railroad, now head of the Federal Railroad Administration. So we have an opportunity here and one that we need to follow through on. The last point I'll make is this. I know that your interest is in minority contracting to make this happen. I know that the President shares that goal, to make sure that we not only realize these American dreams, but when you look at the people who will make it happen, that it really looks like America, black, white, and brown working together to show that we still have in America that spirit and that determination to dream big and to make it happen. High-speed rail transit uh, across the board is going to be our opportunity to do it. I close by saluting Hasea for their leadership in bringing this magnificent crowd together. We're going to do our part as part of your delegation to make sure that this becomes a reality in our time. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator Durbin, uh, for your remarks. Uh, we do understand, certainly, that uh, you've had a busy schedule before you today, yet to once again thank you very much for presenting our keynote address. Our next speaker um, 
is unfortunately a substitute, but just the same though, it's an individual that is uh, very well known throughout uh, the state of Illinois government. And uh, he's going to speak with us today here uh, in hopes of addressing some of the issues more locally here with regards to high speed rail. And with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jack Levin, the Chief Operating Officer from the Governor's Office. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, on behalf of Governor Pat Quinn, very happy to be here this morning. I apologize uh, on his behalf. As Paul mentioned, um, got a call over the weekend. Uh, President Obama's coming to town, and he wanted to meet uh, right before he addressed the uh, American Medical Association this morning. So uh, he had to go to that. Our president called. I'm sure one of the things he'll be lobbying on uh, for is the high-speed rail. Um, so uh, once again, I apologize uh, for him being absent here, but I'm uh, very excited to be here. And I want to thank Paul uh, and Hasia uh, for putting this together. It's a very timely event, uh, high-speed rail. Uh, it's 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 very exciting time. There's lots of things happening. June 17th, there'll be guidelines coming out to say how uh, states or regions of the country are going to compete for this money. So I think it's a, a very appropriate time to have this uh, symposium today and talk about high-speed rail and what it's going to mean for the state of Illinois. So Hasia, Paul, thank you very much for your leadership on this and putting this together. I also, I know Senator Durbin has left, but I, I just want to uh, compliment him. Uh, on Friday, another big project, the federal project, is coming to Illinois. Uh, we've been working on it for over five years. Uh, the previous administration kind of put a hold on it, but now it looks like it's moving forward again, and that's FutureGen. Uh, it's a project in Mattoon, Illinois, um, and it will be a, a, a clean coal uh, project, uh, uh, almost a $1.5 billion project, create a lot of jobs, uh, I'm sure. Uh, Hasia is well aware of it and working on it, but this is the latest technology in, in, in clean coal and for Illinois that's a very important thing and it could mean $1.1 $1 billion of federal money coming to Illinois and, and really it couldn't have happened without the leadership of Senator Durbin. So we're going to get $1.1 billion for future gen. We're hoping to double down and get $2.2 billion on high speed rail with the help of Senator Durbin. So I just want to thank Senator Durbin for his, his leadership. Um, I also want to uh, mention uh, Senator Marty Sandoval. Uh, as, uh, as he is here, he, he's a great advocate and representative uh, for Hacia for minority business owners. But he was also one of the people in the state senate. He's chair of the transportation committee, but understood what high-speed rail means to Illinois and looking at uh, transportation from a comprehensive uh, viewpoint. And he stood up. Uh, when it looked like maybe high-speed rail might not make it into the Capitol bill. He stood up uh, for that, and I want to thank Senator Marty Sandoval for his leadership. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Senator Durbin also mentioned Elaine Neckrich. She's, uh, uh, along with uh, Senator Sandoval, brought, I think, 40 legislators, bipartisan, uh, in to see Governor Quinn uh, in early May to talk about rail in Illinois uh, and the importance of rail in Illinois. And I think some of the fruits of their labor in that meeting uh, were here today uh, uh, because of that. So uh, I think those two have been great leaders in the state legislature uh, on that. I know in a moment you're going to hear from uh, our Secretary of Transportation from Illinois, Gary Hannig. Gary uh, is doing a great job. And one of the first priorities he had is how do we get uh, more minority and women participation in the projects at the Department of Transportation. I know he'll talk about that more when he's up here, uh, but Gary's doing a great job and that was one of the first priorities Governor Quinn gave him and, and Gary's really taken it and run with it. So thank you, Gary. And also we may have a couple people in the crowd from the governor's staff that I just want to mention. Christy LaFleur is a deputy chief of staff uh, she is primary responsibility is working on the, the federal stimulus package. Um, Gloria Matier is working on minority women business issues. And Billy Ocasio, uh, senior advisor to Governor Quinn, uh, is working on a lot of issues relating to economic development, minority business issues, uh, Latino uh, issues for the governor. So 
If they're here, raise their hands and let's give them a round of applause and please uh, network with them today. This really the culmination of several years, uh, I think 10 years of work and many of the people in this room on the Midwest Railroad Initiative, uh, working in Illinois, working uh, with nine other states uh, in the Midwest has really put the Midwest on the map and, and, and made it so that when nationally we look at 11 corridors uh, for high speed rail, uh, the Federal Railroad Administration has said the Midwest is really the best prepared uh, to make something happen immediately. And part of what uh, President Obama is looking for and, and with the federal stimulus is things that can happen quickly, timely, and create jobs. And really it's the culmination of a, a work of, of nine states in the mes Midwest, many of the people in this room, including Hacia, to really uh, put us in the position that we are in uh, to take advantage of this. About uh, 10 days ago, Governor Quinn and I went to Washington, D.C. We met with Senator Durbin. We met with Ray LaHood. Uh, we met with uh, Vice President Joe Biden and eight other governors who are going to be competing for this money. Uh, so it's going to be competitive, but I, I think we've got a good chance at this. As Senator Durbin said, we've, we've got the dream team, I think, working on it. Obviously, President Obama at the top. We've got a few people in the White House, Rahm Emanuel, David Axelrod. We've got uh, Ray LaHood as Secretary of Transportation. Uh, uh, Senator Durbin mentioned Tom Carper. Tom also used to work at the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. So I think we've got a lot of people in Washington, D.C. and Joe Zabo at the Federal Railroad Administration who understand and have actually been working on the Midwest Rail Initiative. So we, I think we have a great opportunity and uh, we have great commitment uh, to make it happen. Part of what came out of uh, the meeting 10 days ago, uh, Governor Quinn, Mayor Daley, who's also been at the forefront of this issue, and Senator Durbin have called for a Midwest uh, rail, rail Summit. Uh, we're going to do that, uh, I think, sometime in July. We're going to invite, uh, of course, Illinois, but the eight other governors around us and their point people on high-speed rail and transportation um, and work to uh, make sure that uh, we're coming together uh, as a region and show why this is important to the region, and that's going to help us be successful uh, in getting uh, the most we can out of the stimulus money uh, for the high-speed rail uh, uh, initiative. Um, as uh, uh, Senator Durbin said, it's $8 billion available nationwide in the stimulus. Following that, a $1 billion a year for the next five years. Uh, Illinois plans to uh, apply for more than $2 billion uh, with the primary uh, uh, place uh, run being the Chicago to St. Louis run, but we're also looking at Chicago to Detroit, Chicago to Milwaukee and Madison, um, and eventually on to Minneapolis. But we're looking at uh, also all of the Midwest, Indianapolis to Ohio to Iowa, um, all of these uh, places in the Midwest. Um, and, and we're at a point uh, where we, we can do this. Uh, Governor Quinn looks at transportation in a comprehensive way, not just about roads and bridges. We do a great job on roads and bridges. But for the future, we have to look at transportation comprehensively. We have to look at how it's it going to not only create jobs, but relieve congestion, help our environment, help move people uh, to where they need to get to go, help move freight where, where it needs to, to, to go. And that's why. Governor Quinn, in this capital bill, is, is investing more in rail than any other governor in the history of Illinois. Uh, 400 million in high-speed rail, 300 million in Create, 150 million uh, for Amtrak. Addressing all the rail issues, addressing transportation from a comprehensive way, we need to move people, we also need to move freight. We're the hub of the nation, we're the, we're, uh, the freight capital uh, in the Midwest, all freight moving across the country moves through us. But if we don't stay competitive, we don't make sure that we're helping freight move through more efficiently, we're going to lose that. Long Beach in California is already losing uh, uh, freight traffic uh, to other, other ports in Canada and Mexico. If freight can move more efficiently uh, through other places, uh, we'll be left behind. And if it starts moving through other places, it may go to Tennessee, Nashville, Memphis, whatever. We need to make sure we're making the, these investments so that we can make sure we're looking at it comprehensively from a rail, a freight, a business standpoint, 
um, and creating jobs. Um, and that would, that's what Governor uh, Quinn is doing. And we want to make sure that rail for passengers and freight can coexist uh, and work together. Uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation is looking at a number of, of criteria. I think we're doing great on all of them. We can do quick Im implementation. We can create a lot of jobs. We have regional uh, uh, cooperation, and we're going to keep that together through the nine states in the Midwest. We've already invested $150 million in high-speed rail uh, in Illinois to get where we are. We have one, another thing they're looking for is the, the, the passenger ridership. And our ridership has increased 25% each of the last two years. In 2007 and 2005, we have over 1.5 million uh, passengers for Amtrak uh, uh, through Illinois. So all of these things uh, are positive things for us in addition to the, the network that we've built uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. and throughout the Midwest. All is going to help us uh, be successful uh, in getting this. this and uh, rail investment, uh, for every uh, uh, dollar investment in rails, we get $3 in economic impact. We also create jobs. I think it creates more jobs. A rail investment creates more jobs than roads and bridges, actually. And these are, these are good jobs, often uh, yeah, union jobs, uh, but often jobs that we can get uh, uh, small businesses of, uh, the ability to have an opportunity to be part of, of this uh, big investment. So uh, we're very excited. Uh, uh, we think that we're ready to go. Uh, the stars have aligned. Uh, and We have a great opportunity before us. So we want to make sure we take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and this symposium today is going to help us organize, continue to organize to be ready. The, the Midwest uh, Summit that we'll do in July, bringing all the governors together, perhaps signing some kind of compact similar to what the Great Lakes states did on the compact to take care of the Great Lakes. Let's sign a compact about how we're going to do uh, rail transportation throughout the Midwest. And, and if we can do this, we're going to create jobs. It's going to give us a, 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 a better opportunity to win in Chicago 2016 just by making this investment. And when we get Chicago 2016, it's going to help us move people throughout the Midwest and get people uh, to come to the Olympics, which will create more economic opportunity uh, for all of us. And of course, Senator Durbin also mentioned the manufacturing jobs that will come with this. We have manufacturers in, in Illinois, uh, but once we start making this investment, we're going to get more manufacturers and more suppliers uh, here in Illinois. Uh, so this is a great opportunity uh, for us. Um, I want to just uh, switch gears for a moment. Uh, Senator Durbin mentioned it. Uh, our, our, our budget crisis that we have here in Illinois. Uh, High-speed rail is a very positive thing. It's capital investment. It's creating jobs. Uh, that's what we want to do. Our budget that we have today uh, for Illinois uh, is not going to do that. Uh, the budget is what we call a 50 percent budget. It still leaves a $9 billion hole in the state. It means drastic cuts. Uh, we all know we need to tighten our belts and cut. We've already cut uh, over a, a billion dollars, $1.3 billion from the budget. We know we're going to have to make more cuts, even with a tax increase, even with addressing the pension issue uh, in the state of Illinois. Uh, but right now, uh, we still face an almost $9 billion deficit with the budget that passed in Springfield. And what that means is we'll have to make drastic cuts. And letters went out Friday to social service agencies uh, across the state, uh, to people that serve people with developmental disabilities, child care advocates, uh, uh, DCFS and foster kids, uh, mental health facilities. All these things are, are in jeopardy at this point. In fact, we have estimates uh, that over 100,000 jobs will be lost if these cuts stay in place. So while we're investing in capital and creating jobs, we're also losing jobs if we don't um, address uh, uh, the issue. Some of the consequences of this are 80,000 low-income working mothers would lose child care services, 20,000 seniors would lose services they need to stay in their homes, 175,000 people would lose community mental health services, over 450,000 children and teens would lose critical services in areas such as substance abuse teen pregnancy, violence, uh, delinquency. I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I just want all of you to be aware this is what's happening. 
these letters went out, uh, there's going to be drastic cuts. Agencies are cutting 50 percent uh, of their budgets. Uh, and, and we have some agency directors uh, here today. Uh, we need to address this issue. As Senator Durbin said, Governor Quinn uh, came out for a tax increase. It's not a popular thing, but he feels we need to have an honest uh, budget and we need to uh, have an honest, part of an honest budget is paying businesses on time. Right now we have uh, uh, some providers that are 260 days behind in getting paid. If we don't start addressing this, we're going to put businesses out of business. And uh, who, who ends up paying for that is the small businesses uh, in Illinois. So I don't want to dwell on that too much, but I want to let you know that this is happening. I urge you to talk to your legislators. We are tightening our belt. We've made a billion three in cuts. Even with a tax increase, we're going to have to cut another one and a half billion dollars uh, from the budget, so we're still making tough uh, cuts uh, to a state budget that has the lowest number of employees per capita in the country, Illinois. So uh, I urge you to call your legislators and, and work with them uh, to try and uh, help us get through this terrible budget crisis. Uh, Four billion dollars in revenue lost because the economy uh, went down. Uh, so uh, I urge you to, to work with us and try to get that so we can save uh, jobs in Illinois and not make terrible cuts uh, for human services and in economic, tough economic times, our most vulnerable citizens need those services uh, even more in these tough times. But anyways, I want to thank you all for coming today. Thank you for having me. Once again, I want to apologize on behalf of Pat Quinn for not being here. Uh, but I appreciate Hasia putting on this symposium. I want to thank uh, Paul Serpa again uh, for putting this on. This is a very important symposium. It's going to be a long-term investment for the state of Illinois. It's really going to be a legacy in transportation, as Senator Durbin mentioned, uh, with our President Lincoln and, and the Transcontinental Railroad. This is another opportunity to build a legacy, create jobs, make sure that uh, all our businesses have a fair chance, have an opportunity to participate in this great investment. And if we do that, uh, we're going to create jobs, good jobs, jobs that you can raise a family on, jobs that you can be proud of, jobs with benefits. Uh, and if we do that, we're going to make Illinois the best state in the nation uh, to live in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. We appreciate your remarks. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce our next presenter, Senator Martin A. Sandoval. For nearly 25 years, Senator Sandoval's life in public service has spanned the federal, county, and state levels. His appointments include the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as well as Commissioner of Metropolitan Reclamation Water District of Greater Chicago. Now, Sandoval is serving his third term as an Illinois State Senator. Prior to holding office, Sandoval led a grassroots movement to turn an abandoned railroad yard that lay at the doorstep of his home in the first school park campus ever designed and built in Chicago. It not only quadrupled green space, and also provided 200 elementary students a school in their own neighborhood. Mayor Richard M. Daley named the campus after his late sister, Socorro Sandoval, a neighborhood school teacher who was killed in a tragic car accident. Today, the Sandoval School Park campus is institution hallmark of the Chicago public schools. On January 30th, 2009, Illinois Senate President John Cullerton appointed Senator Sandoval as the chairman of the Transportation Committee of the Illinois Senate. This appointment came at a critical time to revive the Illinois economy with a major infrastructure program. President Cullerton relied on Senator Sandoval to be a major advocate in passing a comprehensive capital bill during the current 96th legislative session, which will not only build roads, bridges, schools, parks, and libraries, but will put people back to work as well. Senator Sandoval's appointment reflects the ideals of some of the great leaders of the South Side of Chicago that have led the efforts on improving the infrastructure, such as Mayor Daley, Alderman Ed Burke, Speaker Michael Madigan, and Congressman Lipinski. 
Sandoval has proven to be someone who can reach across political aisles to work in solving thorny issues for the ultimate goal of benefiting all families in Illinois, but in particular in his district of the southwest side of Chicago, Cicero, Berwyn, and Stickney. Today, the Senator is also a member of the Appropriations, License Activities, and Energy Committees, and he also served as Chairman of the Illinois Senate of Commerce and Economic Development Committee. It gives me great pleasure to present our next speaker, Senator Martin A. Sandoval. Well, thank you. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. I think we've had enough coffee this morning. Uh, we've had some rousing speeches. Uh, it's tough to follow uh, uh, our great uh, statesman from the U.S. Senate, Dick Durbin, and Governor Quinn's uh, Chief Operating Officer, Jack Levin, but I'll try my best. I, uh, it's great to be here before Hacia. I want to give credit to Paul Serpa and the, and the Board of Hacia for having the symposium. There is no other business association that's gotten in front of high-speed rail but Hacia. So I want to thank Paul Serpa. Let's give him a round of applause for Paul and Hacia. You know, it's kind of ironic that uh, Hacia uh, Minority Business uh, Advocacy Organization is, is uh, uh, it's not ironic, it's appropriate, holding the symposium on high-speed rail. You know, today in Illinois, the Hispanics are not only leaving their mark on the demographics of this great state by being 14% of the population, but they're leaving the marks in the halls of the General Assembly because today, uh, under, uh, at this point in history, Hispanics are in key leadership positions. For example, in the Illinois House, many of you may not know this, but the chairman of the Infrastructure Committee in the Illinois House is a Latino. His name is Luis Arroyo. He's chairman of the House Infrastructure Committee that has an impact on a lot of the projects that are going to be taking place over the next five years. In addition to that, you will realize that in the Illinois House Transit Committee, over half the members of the committee are Latinos, are Latino legislators. And so they are in the House making a huge impact and the lives of all the people of Illinois. In the Senate, what can I tell you? Uh, there is the Illinois Senate Transportation Committee. I am honored that uh, President Cullerton in his first appointment, uh, first few appointments, uh, asked me to consider this uh, a great responsibility. I am the only Latino to serve on the Illinois Senate Transportation Committee, and I'm the only Chicagoan to sit on that committee. But it's appropriate that also there is a Latino who serves as the chairman of that committee. So I think uh, my hat's off to Hacia, my hat's off to the minority business advocates. We are certainly going to make an impact, not only on the lives of people in Illinois, but on the transportation industry here in Illinois. Um, and I, I promise you, many of you know me, I usually have parties and we have mariachi bands. We won't have mariachi bands all over our CTA trains and uh, Amtrak trains. <laughs> We may get there eventually. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a great day to be in Illinois, and there are a lot of things that perhaps uh, are in the back of our minds, and Jack mentioned, uh, you know, the, the continued budget uh, situation that we have in Illinois, and I know that with our great governor, Pat Quinn, he is up to the challenge. He has already demonstrated to me over these last few months that he is up to the challenge. Um, you know, we could not pass a capital bill uh, if our life depended on it over the last six years. There was no way, every time that there was an opportunity to put people back to work over the last six years under the previous governor, we just couldn't get it done. And we couldn't get it done because we didn't believe in trusting the guy that was sitting in the executive office. Today, six years later, six years later, under the leadership of Governor Pat Quinn, he has been able to bring together Mike Madigan, Senate President John Cullerton, Christine Redonio, Tom Cross, the four leaders, and get it done. And I, my hat's off to, uh, to Pat Quinn because, um, like no other governor, he has made and led in the greatest investment in infrastructure ever in the history of the state of Illinois, and he should be applauded for that.
You know, when I was asked just a few uh, months ago to consider an appointment by John Carleton, I first is when you represent the city of Chicago, you need to speak to a few people. Uh, well, I decided to go reach out to our good friend, Mayor Daly, on the fifth floor of City Hall uh, because I thought it was important that I uh, not uh, take on a responsibility if I thought that I couldn't deliver, couldn't be up to it. And the, the um, last time I had met with uh, Mayor Daly before that was when he asked me, on a serious note, to run for the Illinois Senate seat six, seven years ago. And prior to that, when he asked me to leave the federal government and take a 50% cut in my salary to be a commissioner at the Water Reclamation District. <laughs> it, I don't know if that was necessarily a good move, but certainly uh, when uh, the man on the fifth floor thinks it's a great idea, you've got to listen. And he said to me, Marty, you come out of a great, rich tradition of leaders that believe in investing in infrastructure. You know, your congressman, former, co former congressman Bill Lipinski and current congressman Dan Lipinski, you know, sit, have led in the Transportation Committee in Washington, currently lead on the Transportation Committee in, in uh, Washington. Uh, Ed Burke, Ed Burke, the dean of the city council, the man that knows that by investing in infrastructure, institutions, firehouses, police stations, parks, libraries, can you improve the quality of life of the people in your neighborhood? And who cannot say but Mike Madigan, who also sits in my backyard, who has made his lifelong mark by investing in infrastructure and community and in neighborhoods. And he said to me, I need you to really take that responsibility and I need you to start turning heads, to start moving forward and turn the dynamics in Springfield. And so he didn't have to say much to a guy like some of you who know Marty Sandoval. It doesn't take much. It's kind of like a bull with a red cape. You go right at it. And so, you know, just in a few months, we have really changed the dynamics in Springfield. We have really attempted to make a mart in Springfield with our good friend Gary Hanning, who understands the legislative process, the new Secretary of Transportation at IDOT, some good friends in the, uh, in the executive office of Governor Quinn, like Jack Levin, and, and our friends in, in both uh, Speaker Madigan and, and uh, John Cullerton in the Senate. We have been able to really, really ratchet up when it comes to our, our transportation infrastructure and uh, investing in, in jobs and putting people back to work. Today, like no other moment in history, we have made a greatest investment in transit more than any other governor has in the past two decades. We have made billions of dollars, $2 billion investment in transit, investing in our mass transit, the second largest public uh, uh, transit system in America, the CTA, we are going to make sure that our infrastructure is prepared for 2016. We have made the greatest amount of investment in CREATE. We can't talk about high-speed rail if we can't improve some of, the, some of our uh, rail infrastructure that's been long abandoned. We have made a greater investment in CREATE, more than the federal government did, so $300 million. We have doubled our investment in Amtrak over the last few years, therefore doubling ridership on Amtrak. It's unheard of that a state would make an investment in, so, in a federal corporation like Amtrak. The state of Illinois has done that. And we have done that with the leadership provided by Pat Quinn and our leaders in the Illinois House and the Illinois Senate. Unheard of precedential investments in transportation infrastructure. Not to say high-speed rail. The story is true. Uh, I want to applaud Dick Durbin's leadership and our President Obama for uh, their vision for high-speed rail in this country. But you all know and I know that if there is an investment by uh, the people in the state of Illinois General Assembly, nothing happens. And you know, in the final few days of the Illinois legislature, uh, the regular Illinois legislature, you know, I was conferred upon by Governor Quinn and he brought me in and he brought also our friends from the High Speed Rail Association should be credit for that, who have been worked hard for the last few years. Rick Harnish and Dan Johnson Weinberg, are you in the crowd? Uh, the High Speed Rail Association, there he is, Dan. Let's give them a round of applause. And he brought some of us into his office and, and Pat said, you know, I cannot leave the, the, this legislative session without making an investment in high-speed rail, Marty. You know, the leaders are a little bit kind of 
uh, kind of uh, not all supportive because obviously $400 million, $500 million, that's enough, uh, that's enough investment to build a lot of other schools and libraries and parks and a bunch of other initiatives. But you know, he said, I need help. And I need help for you to go into Mike Madigan and to John Cullerton to make this a real issue and to be a champ to make sure that the train doesn't leave Springfield this legislative session without making that investment. Our next presenter comes all the way, well, not quite all the way, from Spain. To be honest with you, Jose Luis Briseño is a native of Madrid and has lived in Chicago for nine and a half years. He currently serves as the director of the Department of Industry and Technology at the Trade Commission of Spain, TCS. His previous position at the commission was Director of Information and Investment Services. TCS helps promote Spain-based enterprises seeking opportunities within the U.S. market. As the director of the department, he oversees all promotional activities and material coordinated by TCS, as well as the market research and investment services carried out by the office. Mr. Berseño holds a postgraduate degree as a foreign trade specialist at IMAF. In addition, he has a Master's of Arts degree in European Law and Economy and a degree in Law from the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. Uh, the Trade Commission of Spain and Chicago is part of the network of commercial offices of the Spanish Institute of Foreign Trade. An assistant promotes Spanish firms entering the United States market as well as American firms seeking investment in Spanish project, products. Um, the commission itself focuses on industry and technology, and the Trade Commission of Spain provides economic trade-related information to companies seeking opportunities in the United States. Please join me in welcoming from the Trade Commercial Office of Spain, Mr. Jose Luis Briseño, Director of Industry and Infrastructure. Thank you. Um, good morning to you all, um, and I'd like to thank ASEA for having me here and giving me the opportunity to present um, the remarkable development of a rail, high rail industry in Spain in the last 20 years. And uh, I think it will prove inspiring uh, because we started out from a situation that was very much like the one here right now where basically service didn't cover the citizens' needs. So um, Spain, Spain's economy was growing, and we decided to go for uh, some sort of in investment infrastructure that could help along, and in, in itself, it would be an engine for economic growth. The first decision was taken to build the first line from Madrid to Seville, or Seville to Madrid, um, and that was 1992. Uh, there were critics uh, regarding the perceived cost, but we know that investment in infrastructure gives you many returns, not just economic returns, but social returns as well. But even in economy, basically, if you invest $1, if it's well spent, you get $3 out of it. So this, this was a, a case in point because it proved that um, citizens uh, basically loved it. Um, there was a modal shift, and uh, it created new demand. 32% of new demand uh, created of people traveling between the two cities. And that laid the track metaphorically and literally for new high-speed lines ar around the country because every city wanted a, a, a high-speed um, line to their city. It was such a success. We saw that um, basically half uh, of the people traveling between the two cities right now take the train. If you compare it to the planes, uh, it's 89% would take the train vis-a-vis -vis, uh, planes, which would be 11%. So why do they do it? Um, because it can travel from city center to city center. Uh, travel time is competitive. They do it in comfort with excellent service, both at the onboard and on, on in stations. 
And there's reliability, very important for business travelers, uh, on-time commitment. I'll get back to that later on. Price is also reasonable. So um, you have many people that are taking the train in Spain right now. And uh, we can see what's happened um, in, in later years. Uh, so this success um, propelled the government to um, roll out a plan, a master plan of transportation that would span for uh, 15 years. And it's an extraordinary investment effort. Um, basically, if you see the, the amount dedicated especially to high-speed railroad, it's 69% out of that and $117 billion. Um, you see, that's quite a lot of money. And uh, there, there were also organi organizational is issues. Uh, we created an infrastructure management separated from the operator, and there's competition right now in the operation. So there are business criteria that propels best practices and, and competitive um, and profitable operations in many of the lines. What, which were the main targets of the, um, of the master plan for transportation? Um, social integration, territorial integration, and I think I'll use this example later on for Midwest and Illinois. Uh, economic development, because it also leads to employment creation and sustainability of the system. This is the map uh, of the lines existing right now and the ones that are planned. Um, sorry. There was the first line to, to the south, Seville. And uh, later on, uh, there were further lines uh, where we expanded to the Mediterranean coast, um, and then um, later on to um, Saragossa in the middle. Uh, let me see, right there. And later on, last year, to Barcelona, which is basically the jewel of the system, the two largest Spanish cities, and it's, it's also been a resounding success. In, in one year, basically, it, it already has 45% of the people traveling between the two cities. What we have also is a, a node in, in the center of Spain, in the city of Valladolid, which is very important to cover the northern quadrant, which is coming next. We also have a connection from Barcelona to the French border coming up, and one to Portugal. The French connection is interesting because it's the first time we have public-private partnership doing that. And we also have freight transportation that's going to be used in high-speed lines, first time that's happened. So right now, the situation that Spain is in is uh, basically the second largest in the world in length of high-speed miles, and we hope to be uh, uh, first uh, next year, probably with permission of the, our friends, the Chinese. <clears throat> and today, 40% of the Spanish population lives within 30 miles of a high-speed station. It's going to be 55 in 2012 and 90% uh, in 2020. So, um, I think you're fortunate here in Illinois. You have it kind of n not bad, but in Spain, uh, the, the terrain's not as, as flat as it is here, for example, from, from Chicago to San Luis. Um, so the terrain's really ragged, many mountains, and that's um, basically involved that a lot of the construction engineering companies had to acquire a very specific sets of skills um, and have basically become some of the most sophisticated in the world um, in from tunneling, uh, infrastructure management, um, um, designing, uh, all, you name it, they got it. And right now, uh, something that really tells about the top technical capabilities they have is that uh, according to the GAO uh, office here in the States, they are the lowest cost per mile uh, b built in the existing high-speed rail systems in the world. So this also tells you a little bit about some other effects, positive effects created by this investment in high-speed rail. Your companies start acquiring new skills and they take them all around the world, competing uh, everywhere with local partners in consortia that really make it easy for transportation authorities because um, they, they basically can cover the whole proje project cycle. Uh, another good effect of this um, investment in transportation was all the set of um, bridges, viaducts, and uh, especially very important in high-speed um, dedicated controls, control centers to monitor where each train is at any given time. This is especially important for safety reasons. And um, there are also very good companies in ITS and, and signaling, uh, where Spain is also a pioneer, that are have invested a lot in that, and are right now um, competing around the world. 
So basically, what, what service do we have? Um, we have very high speed um, uh, service, long distance. You saw the, some of the lines here. I, I, we've, I've included the, the ones from the coast, for example, from Malaga to um, Barcelona, it's almost eight, 700 miles of very high speed. One of the largest in the world, and the uh, longest in the world. And uh, here, the medium distance service is very interesting because it, it's very important for um, cities um, that are medium sized and not the, the large cities that are normally connected between the, these high-speed lines. Medium-sized cities are one of the main beneficiaries of this investment. Uh, it was one of the surprises that um, people realized that, for example, here in, in, in Illinois, Chicago, of course, is going to be a, a main hub for all this development. But Springfield could be one of the, of the cities that would benefit more because a lot of investment, a lot of companies decide to to set up their, their factories, their, their offices there when you have a game-changing proposition of being able to travel very fast to, the, to a main capital as well connected by a plane. So this is very interesting. And we have frequencies that go from point to point and then other frequencies along the day that go to these medium-sized cities in the middle. And finally, we, uh, take, uh, we profit from the high-speed train and connect to the conventional services that are already pretty, uh, it's already a pretty good speed, 137 miles per hour. And all of these, at this point, I'd like to point out that this wouldn't be um, anywhere near as useful if we didn't have a very good infrastructure of multimodal uh, hubs connecting to other modes of transportation. And this has been the case in Spain where there was also a revival in short distance in subways, light rail, um, basically, now we have some of the lo longest um, um, services like in Madrid, third town in the world in, in uh, metro and light rail systems. So this is also very important. You have to connect people uh, uh, in, a, in a capillary way, uh, way to where they're actually living. Another spillover effect of this investment is um, having the best um, fleet of trains, uh, train sets in the world and uh, having a, a whole industry created, as Senator Durbin was mentioning, um, and this could happen in, in Illinois as well, or, or, or the whole United States. Spain be became a hub of manufacturing with Alstom uh, manufacturing in Spain. Um, we have Vaslo manufacturing in Valencia, but we have our own uh, specific uh, manufacturers, very fine uh, transit manufacturers, Talgo and CAF. We have been in, in the United States for quite some time. Um, Talgo has uh, trains that are running the Pacific Northwest Corridor. It's also a glimpse of, of some of what uh, modern travel can do for you because it's one of the lines with more customer satisfaction and increases in ridership. This is a train that goes up to 120 miles per hour, but, uh, but you, they can do things like this uh, train here and down below is the Talgo 350 that goes up to, that's the, the, the speed in kilometers, 350, I guess it's around 220 miles. Our, we have CAF here, which is another um, very good uh, train manufacturer and, and that has um, also trains for um, light read vehicles, but also trains that go uh, in high speed for the French border connection. So this is another very important fact that you get when you, when you, see, uh, when you have investment in, in railways. And I'd like to uh, skip over this uh, really fast because I already talked about it. Um, we, this is the, the effect that the, the new line to Barcelona had, and you see that in basically a year, you get almost 50% of the people traveling. Uh, uh, market share has gone up uh, really fast, and it's, it's expected that it'll continue to go up. And uh, something I'd like to stop here for a second, because the, the on-time commitment is very important. If, if the train doesn't arrive in, in five minutes, if there's a delay of over five minutes, you get a full refund. Needless to say, it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> if, if, if the train is, has a, a delay of more than five minutes, you get a full refund on your ticket. And they can do that because they're really punctual. It's a, Spanish network is the second uh, most punctual in the world after Japan uh, Railways. You see, it's really almost impossible to get a refund, but you can try. <laughs> and I'd like to skip over really fast uh, with the, the, the advantages that rail transportation offers in terms of less land occupied and besides they go parallel to existing roads so that's another advantage I think
think JD will talk about that um, for a while too, uh, about environmentally friendly transportation, another big benefit of rail. And this is the comparison to plane and, and CO2 emissions, uh, plane and, and, and train. So to bring things home for, uh, for a while, I'd like to make a comparison between Sp Spain and some of the lines in Spain, like Madrid-Seville, 293 miles, and Chicago-San Luis, 298. You, you see they're pretty similar. There are some other comparisons that can be made. But I'd really like to point out, and, and also we have um, a central hub like Madrid and Chicago, and a lot of big cities in the per periphery. So I, I like to come again to this point, to have a big territorial cohesion uh, and, and to have cities in the middle that are going to um, really benefit from that and, and stop the drain of people going to the big cities. This is gonna be very important for them, for cities like Kalamazoo, uh, for cities like in, in the middle uh, between the, those big lines. And I think you have uh, the leaders with a vision to do it, and they need, you know, basically all your support. So we, we'd also like to assist in any way we can. We've had uh, Secretary LaHood uh, visiting Spain recently. Uh, we've worked with the Midwest uh, Rail Passenger Commission and Midwest um, High Speed Rail Association with Ray Carnish. You have uh, great leaders and campaigners for high speed, so I wish you the best of luck. Well, thank you, Mr. Briseño, for that interesting presentation. And uh, for our friends from Metra and CTA, there was a part of his presentation I hope you took note with, and that's a refund if the train is not in in five minutes. What a wonderful concept. Thank you again. I want to move on to our next presenter, and a little closer back to home from Europe, and that is the presentation from SE3's LLC, Mr. J.D. Stokes, its vice president. Mr. Stokes is its vice president of SE3, which is a minority-owned DBE professional service business and a HACIA member, with the primary focus on advanced infrastructure systems and implementing smart technologies in support of systems, engineering, environment, and energy projects. Um, Mr. Stokes has been a part of high-speed rail as a former transportation engineer with the Federal Highway Administration, he was involved with Section 1010 of ICE-T. Section 1010 authorized the designation of five high-speed rail corridors by the Secretary of Transportation and provided $30 million for the elimination of highway rail grade crossings in nine states. Specifically, these grade crossings hazards eliminated the construction elimination of construction projects were envisioned to build upon the precepts established in the Swift Rail Development Act of November of 1994, which authorized $184 million for corridor planning and technology improvements. Specifically, Mr. Stokes worked to assist in the implementation of LOSAN, the Los Angeles-San Diego State Passenger High-Speed Corridor. Moreover, T21 authorized the Losan Rail Corridor for Alternatives Analysis and Preliminary Engineering, in which Mr. Stokes also helped administer, including close coordination with the appropriations of $19.8 million in Section 5309 of New START funds for several grade separation projects. Mr. Stokes has surmounted certainly over a decade of time working directly with various departments of transportation, including California, Hawaii, Illinois, Kansas, Missouri, and Texas, from project development to full design construction oversight and management of major highway, tollway, transit, and intelligent transportation systems. Mr. Stokes has a Master's of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of California, as well as possessing a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Kansas. Please join me in welcoming Mr. J.D. Stokes from SE33. Thank you, Mr. Serpa. It is really, truly a tremendous honor to be here today with such distinguished speakers and uh, Mr. Serpa for putting this together today for your all's attendance. Uh, and to follow up from my colleague from Spain, as you can see, they're much faster ahead of us than we are at this point, but I know we can catch up quick and 
hopefully surpass them. Uh, I'm very passionate about this. When I was first had a chance to work on it in California, uh, although the, the bio sounds like I ran the program, I really didn't. <laughs> it was really more a matter of just being at the right place at the right time, working with key people with the Federal Rail Administration, uh, the California Division of Rail, and other key folks uh, that had that quarter at that time, which has actually grown tremendously over the last few years. But as tremendous as that opportunity is in California, it really isn't as tremendous of an opportunity as we have here in Illinois. And the main reason for that is because California is a very long state. Here in Chicago, it is the hub of many major key cities that have been around for a lot longer than California. And they invested in rail a lot longer than California has. And so I'm actually much happier to be here in Illinois with that potential. Not to put down California for the hard work they've done, but I truly see the potential here, and hopefully today you do as well. But if we look around the world beyond just Spain, we'll see that it's already happening in Japan. They've proven competitiveness to airlines up to around 600 miles in distance. They've got 90 trains that run at over 190 miles an hour today. They've already invested in 1,000 miles of high-speed tracks with over 1,300 more miles planned for service by 2010. And as my colleague pointed out from Spain and Europe, they've invested heavily as well. But if you stop and think about where we live in Chicago, and if you overlaid the map of Europe, what you'd find is Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, all fits nicely within there. And as my colleague pointed out, we even have better terrain. We even have rail infrastructure that's already in place. But I'll get to that in a minute. The benefits of high-speed rail are proven. High-speed rail works. The money investment returns on investment. This isn't really a dream. It's competitive with air travel for trips less than four hours. And if you think about it, the commuter flights that you hear about from time to time really don't get a lot of press. That's because people don't really like going to the airport, going through security, spending two hours on an airplane and getting back off again. And if you think about the trips to like from St. Louis to Chicago, that's essentially what those are. And airlines don't make much money providing that service either. But I'll get to that in a minute as well. The environmental benefit is obvious. You realize that 190 miles an hour, it's three times more energy efficient than flying. And you probably heard this ad on the radio, a freight train that's a mile long gets 100 miles to the gallon. Talk about an electric car. TGV itself is practically carbon free. And France, well, they're ahead of the speed record here. You can see that the average speed's already at 189 miles per hour. And that train you see right there in that slide is something that could easily be done here and built here in America with a top speed of 357 miles per hour. So the point is, speed exists, and it can be brought to the U.S., and particularly here in the Midwest, today. Now, obviously, President Obama, that's a mainstay of his program. We've heard from him. And just a few weeks ago, June 3rd, about a week and a half on Wednesday, Vice President Joe Biden, Transitary Secretary Ray LaHood, met with governors around the country. And the bottom line, and this is really the point, think boldly. Just like you see with the Zephyr at the Museum of Science and Industry, they thought boldly then, we need to think boldly today about the future of high-speed trains in America. Now, if we look back at the past, just real quick, we aren't first doing this. We've done this before in this country. Some may remember, I know my grandmother does, from the, up that part of the country, the 20th Century Limited. A little side tidbit there. Even though it was going 56 miles per hour at the turn of the century, which was blazing for the day, that's where the term red carpet came from, because they would roll out the car crimson carpet for the people who had board, and that was referred to as the red carpet treatment. In the 1930s, the speed giants, uh, up to 85 miles an hour, which back then was major. The Hiawatha, the 400, the Abraham Lincoln, and of course, the Zephyr. I don't know if you've had a chance to get down to the Museum of Science and Industry, but you can see it right there in this city. Top speed of 112 miles per hour on May 26, 1934, over 1,000 miles nonstop between Denver and Chicago. At that time, it was very close, just short of the U.S. land speed record of 115 miles per hour. And of course, one of the, many people don't realize it was one of the first pioneering diesel-powered train locomotives, which of course today is industry standard. They celebrated at that time, kind of like we are today, because it brought prosperity. Those communities along those high-speed corridors were able to prosper, just like we're seeing in Europe, not just Chicago or St. Louis, but the cities in between, like Springfield. And that celebration with this, here you can see they proudly display Ride Burlington's new Vista Dome, Denver Zephyr, 
Denver to Chicago. And we see that around the world as well, where countries invest in high-speed rail. That tradition continues today. The Illinois Zephyr, you can pick it up at Naperville. It's daily service between Chicago and Quincy. The California Zephyr runs daily between Chicago and San Francisco. And if you look at Amtrak overall, it would rank eighth in the number of passengers served if it included among U.S. airlines in 2008. Here's the picture of the country today. This is what you see when, during the press conferences. This is where the competition is, so to speak, if we consider our own home here in Chicago. But let's take a look at the money already spent. It isn't that they haven't spent money. A lot of it, private money. Eighty billion total as of 2007 in these quarters around the country. And they're getting results. Now, let me speak a minute about California. This is where I had a chance to first get introduced to High Speed Rail. I even got a chance to ride head in from San Francisco down to San Diego. And one of the interesting parts about that trip was they had to keep slowing down, even though they could go 90 miles an hour, because surfers kept crossing the tracks. <laughs> anyway, that legislation was authorized in 96. They organized a nine-member board, which to date has spent almost 70 million federal state funding. And of course, the environmental uh, benefits are obvious. Don't have to worry about uh, the environmental challenges too much when you get programs like this. Here is the fiscal summary that they've had to date. Completion, they're hoping to get all the improvements in place by 2018, 2020. 55 million per year in ridership, 2.4 billion gross revenue, and we're looking at a plus 1.1 billion net after operating and maintenance. So as I mentioned before, here's proof in the pudding. California is getting it, we can get it too. There is return on investment. It is obvious a federal, state, and public-private partnership, and primarily that's because private needs to be involved because the railroads already own the land. But we wouldn't want to exclude them because they truly have been a major stay and a major industry here in the Chicago and the mid Midwest area. The performance in Illinois could be roughly the same. As my colleague mentioned, the 298-mile basic system connecting a Chicago to a St. Louis community. Round numbers could achieve by 2025, and hopefully sooner if the Olympics come. Ridership, 3.6 million, just in that one quarter alone. Revenue, around 632 million, and a net after operating maintenance, about 166 million. So again, we can make money today out of the gates with existing rail lines we have. Now what does that look like? This is that classic proven hub and spoke infrastructure that I told you about at the beginning. This is what Europe looks like. We are exactly like Europe. California doesn't look like this. To some degree, the Northeast Corridor does, but not near as well. So the potential is here. We've got the support here from our political leaders. I feel that the time is right for to be Chicago to be a leader in the country. So with that one quarter alone, as I mentioned earlier, the ridership does come. It comes from people who don't want to drive cars. And after they've paid $4 a gallon gas and they've gotten comfortable in the train that they've had a chance to enjoy, we're seeing ridership stay up, even though grass prices have gone down. It could be a model for the country. Industry experts and passionate advocates alike say that Chicago is one of the top three. California I mentioned, the Northeast Quarter I mentioned, but I still feel that the, with the web of rail lines centered around Chicago, we could achieve full build and community development by 2025 timeframe. The six largest host railroads are right here in the Chicago area, BNSF Road, Union Pacific, and so on. These are the rail lines that we'd have to partner with to you put the train sets on, but it can be done. Like past major Illinois infrastructure projects, airport, tollway, and highway systems, high-speed high rail would be a major economic stimulant and smart investment in the 21st century. And here's just a quick back-of-the-napkin calculation of looking what the jobs that could be created, the permanent jobs, the overall return on investment for the Chicago to St. Louis quarter. And some of the comparisons. Obviously, we're talking about less cost overall if we try to look at how many people are served, passengers, uh, tra miles traveled, energy savings. If you key in renewable energy, wind power, for example, you can see that this is now a technology that works well with that kind of energy supply. Pollution and safety are also reduced. But really, this tells the whole story. Why did people ride the Zephyr? Or the Super Chief, if you remember that one. It's because they could do work and do things while they traveled. Conferencing, dining, seating, working, lounging all activities at over 100 miles per hour. I'd get a ticket if I tried to do that. Now, could the Chicago end grow like this? Here's a little animation of what induced development might look like if a high-speed rail uh, station were built. 
You can see stadiums and uh, neighborhoods and retail and commercial and a little peak of that train continuing on perhaps to other destinations like, like Union Station and if that isn't where it ends up being. And St. Louis, the same thing. Here you can see a station of relatively modest canopy type structure, but the result would be the same. You would see development of neighborhoods and communities and retail and businesses and so on, and yet these two cities would be connected. So if it's connected, what happens? It's very obvious, folks. The cars cannot provide this. The short-run airlines can't provide this. We're talking about more choice, being able to take transit or walking or however you else might get there and get on that train and get to Chicago or from St. Louis and vice versa. It's safer. When you think about the aspects of, of losing lives, trains don't do that. And it's been proven that very effectively by our colleagues in Europe. It's faster, it's lower cost, decreased energy consumption, two to three times less capital costs, and significantly less environmental impacts. So as you can see, the bottom line is, this is the place to do it, this is the time to do it, the potential is to do it, and the return on investment is there. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, A.D. Our next presenter is from a place uh, which I called my old stomping grounds, the Illinois Department of Transportation. And we have joining us here today its secretary, Mr. Gary Hannock. Gary Hannock was born July some time ago in Litchfield, Illinois. <laughs> he was raised in Mount Olive, Illinois, where he attended Holy Trinity Catholic grade school and Mount Olive Community High School. Before graduating from Mount Olive in 19... some time ago, Gary, you have to talk to your staff on your bios. Gary was selected as a member of the prestigious National Honor Society. Gary attended the University of Illinois in Champaign, where he graduated with honors with a degree in accounting in 1974. Later, he passed the exam to become a certified public accountant. Uh, later on, Gary Hannock was elected as the youngest member of the Illinois House of Representatives at that time. He has served as a member in every General Assembly until uh, he resigned in February of 2009. Gary was appointed Assistant Democratic Leader for the 89th General Assembly and Deputy Majority Leader for the 94th General Assembly. He was the Chief Budget Negotiator for the House Democrats. And on February 28th of 2009, Governor Pat Quinn named Gary Hannig the Secretary of the Illinois Department of Transportation, overseeing personnel engaged in all facets, aspects, and models of transportation in Illinois. It's a pleasure indeed, and certainly join me in welcoming Mr. Gary Hannig, the Secretary for the Illinois Department of Transportation. Thank you, and it's my pleasure to, to be here today. And I want to thank uh, everyone who presented before me who have done such an outstanding job, I think, of laying out the case for high-speed rail. <clears throat> and clearly, if you had gone out to the Illinois Department of Transportation last year and asked about high-speed rail, uh, someone would have probably rifled around out in some cabinet and looked for a file and said, oh, you know, yeah, we got a little bit of something on that. But uh, truthfully, there wasn't very much going on. I think we'd have to say that high-speed rail last year uh, was something that Senator Dick Durbin uh, was working on out in Washington, and that we at the Department of Transportation had done a little bit of work on uh, between St. Louis and Chicago, particularly between Springfield and Dwight. Uh, but there wasn't any real plan uh, to go further than that. But then a lot of things changed suddenly. We elected a president who had a vision for high-speed rail, and we now have a governor who shares that vision for high-speed rail. And so just this year, we signed a memorandum of understanding, the state of Illinois, uh, with the Union Pacific Railroad,
for the purposes of developing the high-speed rail corridor between Chicago and St. Louis. And they should have a plan back to us sometime this month, which appropriately is the time that our federal government will give us the guidance on what they believe needs to be in high-speed rail plans uh, as we go forward. So Union Pacific is developing the blueprint, the plan that we can take out to Washington to show our friends in Washington how we can actually develop a high-speed rail between Chicago and St. Louis, how we can actually make that a reality. And I think it's important, as has been stated earlier, that we recognize that transportation has always been associated with economic development. Just look at the history of our nation, whether it was the railroads, whether it was canals and rivers, uh, whether it was highways or, or four-lane highways. And I think that we understand that high-speed rail has the same kind of possibility for us here in Illinois today. So I'm here today to say that Governor Quinn is a big supporter of high-speed rail. It's a priority for the state of Illinois and the Illinois Department of Transportation. We're prepared to go forward with it. You've heard about the commitment that's come from the state of Illinois, the $400 million in capital money, uh, the $300 million in CREATE, the $150 million that we've committed to Amtrak. So we believe that as we go out to Washington this month, that we'll be in a strong position to make the case uh, that within a reasonable period of time that we can actually see high-speed rail happening. And we're hopeful that by the time the Olympics come to here in Chicago, we'll have high-speed rail between St. Louis and Chicago, between Milwaukee and Chicago, and hopefully between Detroit and Chicago. And we think that would be a wonderful way to celebrate the Olympics. So let me also say that when Governor Quinn asked me to take this job, he asked me to take a look at the Department of Transportation with new eyes and to, and to evaluate the people and to evaluate the programs and to evaluate the system that we have out there. And he reminded me that it's important that we celebrate the diversity of Illinois and that we recognize that Illinois is a very diverse state and that that's a, a strength that we here in Illinois need to always take advantage of. And so he said, make sure that as you run that agency, that very big agency, that you take a look at things and understand diversity is an important part of what you need to do. So along those lines, what we tried to do out at the Department of Transportation uh, is find ways that we can make the process of jobs and contracts, that we can make that something that everyone can share in. So we've looked at it from three different places. We understand if we're going to help minorities in the state of Illinois from the Department of Transportation, we have to make sure that they have their opportunity to get the contracts, to build the roads, to build the bridges, to build high-speed rail. We understand that it's important that they become members of the union. The people that are out there that are actually with the picks and shovels are today more with the road graders and the backhoes. And lastly, but not leastly, it's important that they have an opportunity at the Department of Transportation to get jobs as well as any other group. So what are we doing to make that plan work? Well, we have actually have a selection committee at the department that, that decides who gets consulting contracts. Today there are six members. We're going to make that into seven members. And when the committee next meets in July, I'll assure you that there will be at least one Latino and one African American that sits on that committee. I think that's important because today that's not the case. So we're going to take a step forward and we're going to try to address some of those problems that we've seen in the past. We're going to ask the federal government if they would give us some waivers. The state of Illinois and the Department of Transportation in particular is subject to many of the federal requirements and laws. And consequently, we oftentimes feel that our hands are tied when we have innovative new programs and ideas because the federal guidelines and federal laws simply don't allow. They don't allow us to go forward with those ideas. So we're going to ask for some waivers. We're going to ask that we set up and be allowed to set up some dual goals when we do programs and projects in the state of Illinois. We're going to ask the federal government to look at the small business 
limitations that they now have and allow us to raise those numbers. We feel that one of the problems we have with the qualifications of small businesses today is that those numbers haven't changed since President Clinton uh, was in the White House. And that we have to raise that number to allow people to stay in that category of small business for a longer period of time. It only makes sense. We're looking at what we can do in the state of Illinois to address the problem of bonding. We understand that you have to be qualified to get a contract at the Department of Transportation. We understand that you have to have that ability to perform. And I think we understand that you have to be bonded. But we oftentimes find that many firms that we would otherwise say are qualified and should be able to bid struggle to get the bonding in the state of Illinois. So we've also decided that we would work within the state of Illinois on those projects that are not federal, those projects where we would simply use state money and we'd not be handcuffed by those federal rules, and that there we could create some set-asides and say these are areas where we could have minority contractors bid, we could set those projects aside and try to grow some of our firms so that they could be more competitive, that they could be better firms, and then instead of being a subcontractor, we could hope that these minority firms could grow into being the prime contractors. So those are some of the things that we've done as far as trying to help in the area of the job itself, the, the, the company. And what we've also tried to do then is push our friends at the unions and tell them, look, we understand that there's a lot of unemployment right now, that you've got a lot of people in the, in the hall that are seeking jobs, but we've just passed the biggest construction contract opportunity in the state of Illinois, the capital bill. We've got more opportunities now than we've had ever in Illinois to put people to work on construction jobs. And we know that the federal government is in the process of beginning to rewrite the Transportation Act in Washington. And what we know is that with what we have with the President and with the Secretary of Transportation, with Senator Durbin and our congressional delegation, is a great opportunity to bring even more transportation money here to Illinois. So we've said in our, to our friends in the unions, okay, we're gonna clear the bench of people that are there in the hall, and we're gonna put them to work. But you know what? We wanna see a diverse workforce out there on the job. When we drive past a work place here in Illinois, a job site, we wanna see the diversity of Illinois, and we wanna celebrate the diversity of Illinois on that job site. So we've told the unions that, they said they've heard, the, 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 they heard us, and they're working with us, and now we need to make that a reality. And lastly, what we've tried to do within the Department of Transportation itself is to first of all to understand that mostly what the Department of Transportation does are things that civil engineers do. We're an agency of civil engineers. So we've had job fairs in Chicago and downstate where we've tried to go into minority communities and say to young people, you know, being a civil engineer is a good way to make a living. You ought to think about that. You ought to think about thinking you ought to think about going to college and becoming a civil engineer and oh by the way if you do we'd like to talk to you at IDOT when you graduate. We've also provided for some scholarships where we can go to minorities and say look if you want to be a civil engineer we can help you pay for it and we can help you get through college and then when you're done we're going to offer you a job out at the Department of Transportation and if you'll stay with us and work with us for a few years we'll begin to we'll begin to forgive those loans that we've given you. We'll make sure that that scholarship is something that you don't have to repay. We've also provided some summer jobs for some people. So again, for youngsters who are maybe getting ready to go to college or perhaps they're in college and they're sort of thinking about what it is they'd like to be and do, we'd like to, we'd like to give them a taste of what it might be to be on a job site with a construction company, what it might be to be a civil engineer, so we tried to give them those opportunities. And lastly, we've actually decided that we would recruit civil engineers, not just here in Illinois, where we have great universities and great opportunities, but that we would expand our horizons and we'd look for minority civil engineers throughout the state of Illinois and the United States as well. So those are some of the things that, that we've tried to do at the Department of Transportation, not only for roads and bridges or high-speed rail, 
But I think just what Governor Quinn would say uh, is the strength and diversity of Illinois. So I'm here to tell you that we support high-speed rail. We support the jobs program in, in Springfield. Uh, we support the opportunities in Washington to get more money for transportation. And we support making Illinois the diverse state that it is. And we support making that diversity a part of the Department of Transportation. So I'm happy to be here with you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions later in the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Hannig. Our last presenter is from Amtrak, Mr. Ray Lang, the Senior Director of Government Affairs. Ray Lang was named the Senior Director of State and Local Government Affairs for Amtrak in June of 2006. Lang is based in Chicago and reports to Joe McHugh, Amtrak's Vice President of Government Affairs in Washington. In his role, Mr. Lang directs Amtrak's state and local government affairs all across the country. He is responsible for the company's day-to-day -day contacts with governors of states, states legislators, mayors, and other elected officials throughout the country. Lang joined Amtrak's government affairs in Washington in the fall of 94 after interning in the U.S. House of Representatives for former Congressman Bill Zeliff of New Hampshire. One year later, Mr. Lang re relocated to Chicago after accepting a position in the Government Affairs Office and Amtrak's regional office here in Chicago. Since that time, he has held the positions of increasing responsibility within Amtrak. Lang is a native of suburban Chicago and a graduate of the University of Illinois at Chicago as well. He attended graduate school at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he studied Hebrew and international relations. He is active in numerous regional chambers of commerce and other civic organizations where he advocates for improved passenger rail and closer coordination between Amtrak and the business community. It gives me great pleasure to present to all of you Mr. Ray Lang, Amtrak Senior Director of Government Affairs. Must be an easier way. Exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I, I am, I'm grateful to see you for the invitation to speak here today, and I'm happy to come back. Although in the future, if, if I do come back, please don't make me follow someone who talks about giving full refunds to passengers who are in trains <laughs> in their country of, of, that are more than five minutes late. I, uh, I would love to get there, but we, we simply aren't there yet at Amtrak, but uh, I do appreciate that. And I appreciate the, 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 the uh, opportunity to be in this room. This is one of my favorite spaces in, in, in the entire Chicago region. I really, really do enjoy, enjoy the University Club. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, by telling you a little bit about what Amtrak is and what we do. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to, to have followed so many of these wonderful people on the, on the dais, and I know that Senator Sandoval and Senator Durbin have both left. Uh, they have been very instrumental in sort of shaping uh, what we have become in, in the last year and, and before. And I want to tell you a little bit about what it is we really are and what we do. Uh, we are a federally owned uh, corporation. Amtrak was created by an act of Congress in 1971. Uh, we are set up as a corporation with stock. Our stock is held primarily by the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, we have a board of directors. Our board members are nominated by the President of the United States and uh, subject to Senate confirmation. And uh, as Senator Durbin pointed out, uh, our current chairman was an individual that he, whose name um, Mr. Durbin put forward, and that is Tom Carper of, of Macomb, Illinois. Tom is a, a longtime friend of mine, and I'm thrilled that he is not only on the board, but, uh, but is our chairman. Our board of directors chooses the management team that, that operates the company, and we are operated as though we were a private corporation. Uh, we do, as a corporation, really three different things, and, and the, uh, the slideshow that you saw earlier showed, I think, in pretty good detail some of the three different things 
that we do and what they are. Uh, and in no particular order, the, the first thing that we do is in the northeastern part of the United States, we run the nation's only high-speed rail service, that is the Acela service, which operates between Boston, Massachusetts, New York City, and Washington, D.C. And the Acela service maxes out at 150 miles per hour on that quarter. It is by far our most popular service. It is a premier service uh, for us, and we're very proud to operate that. One of the reasons it only goes as fast as 150 miles per hour is because there are no regulations that exist in the United States for trains to go faster than 150. 151 and above is a new certification. Uh, the FRA has been directed to look at that, but that is as fast as they're legally able to go. It is not as fast as they are able to go. Uh, we're hoping to get there one day. Um, the second thing that we do uh, is uh, that we run the nation's network of long distance overnight passenger trains. And we saw the pictures of the California Zephyr, which uh, operates between Chicago and Oakland, California. That is one of those overnight long distance passenger trains that Amtrak operates. <clears throat> Nationwide, we operate 13 of those overnight long distance passenger trains. There are only 13 of those trains left depending on how you count them. We have the auto train out east, which might be the 14th train. Uh, but the uh, auto, tr the, uh, I'm sorry, the long distance trains, I think, are what captures a lot of Americans' imaginations when they think about rail travel. And when they, if they haven't ridden an Amtrak train before, I think in most parts of the country, when they think of Amtrak, they imagine themselves riding on a long distance train, sitting in a, a sleeping car, having dinner in a dining car. Uh, and it's really, truly a wonderful experience. And I would encourage you to try that uh, if you have not. The third and final thing we, we do, which is what I'll talk about in a little bit here, is that we operate around the country in partnerships with states like Illinois. We operate uh, regional short distance corridor services. And this is the part of Amtrak which is growing the fastest. There are currently uh, 14 states around the country that pay us, contract with us, to operate trains that we would not, not otherwise be operating on services like Chicago to St. Louis or Chicago to Detroit, or Chicago to Milwaukee. Um, those trains, in Los Angeles to San Diego on the Los Angeles corridor, those trains are funded uh, almost entirely by state partners. There's a, we enter into a contract with the state transportation department, uh, and we operate those trains uh, for them, using our access rights over the nation's uh, freight carriers to provide that service. And as I said, that is the part of Amtrak which is growing the fastest. There are 14 states right now, which contract with us to run service. Just last week, we, con we added Virginia uh, as our 15th state partner, and we will start state-supported service in the state of Virginia under contract with VDOT uh, beginning in the fall. And uh, if the, the governor should sign the capital bill and IDOT gets the, the money, uh, we will start service to the Quad Cities in Dubuque, and shortly thereafter, we will add Iowa, I hope, as a 16th state partner, uh, because they're ready to go as well. Uh, as I said, it's the part of our company that's growing the fastest. Uh, it's where our, our tremendous ridership growth has been, and I'll get into talking about that right now. Uh, things are very, very good at Amtrak right now, not just because of the tremendous support and enthusiasm that exists at the legislative level all over the country, but because our ridership is really at an all-time high. We've set ridership records for six consecutive years, <clears throat> and we were going up about a half a million to a million passengers a year until last year. And last year, we went up by 3 million passengers to almost 29 million passengers nationwide. It was an amazing year for us. What's interesting to me and others at Amtrak most about last year is that in previous years, one of the reasons that our ridership was growing was because we were adding new state partners. We are adding new services, adding new frequencies on existing services. Last year, we gained ridership. Our ridership grew by 3 million passengers, but we did not add any new services anywhere in the country nationwide. Uh, so we did not add capacity to the system, but ridership went up by 3 million passengers. And it was really because of gas prices. It really was. Uh, we really can trace it back to that. <clears throat> there are other reasons, other factors, such as congestion uh, and the, 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 the desire or the movement to become green, but it was really gas prices. You'll see here in these charts, uh, looking on a couple of the different services here. In the Midwest, the Hiawatha service, which goes between Chicago and Milwaukee, a 90-mile trip that we do in 89 minutes, the Hiawatha service is continuing to grow by leaps and bounds. It is really a wonderful service for us. It has the highest on-time performance in the Amtrak system. It averages about 97% each month in terms of on-time performance. It is a great service. You'll see, too, in the middle, the middle panel, uh, that is our service between New York City and Washington, D.C., uh, the Acela service, uh, and the conventional trains that we operate there. The New York to Washington, D.C. market is the number one transportation market in the United States. Amtrak is the dominant 
provider of service in that market. We have 63% of that market. All the airlines combined make up the other 37%. So uh, it is true and it is proof that if you have a fast, reliable, dependable service with sexy equipment, uh, people will ride it and they will flock to it, fr quite frankly. Um, this brings us to an interesting thing that happened for us very suddenly last fall. As, as I said, we are a federally owned corporation. We're subject to an annual appropriation and every five or six years or so, Congress writes the authorizing legislation that governs our existence. <clears throat> our previous authorizing bill which was passed in 1997, expired on January 1st of 2003, and we sat unauthorized for more than five years while the Congress debated what the future of Amtrak, what the structure of Amtrak should be. Uh, and last fall, um, thanks in large part to a push from Senator Durbin and some of his colleagues in the Senate, uh, the Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act, what we call PREA, was passed by the Congress and signed into law. It is the reauthorization bill which governs now our existence for the next six years. It is a really fantastic bill and is going to present Amtrak, our state partners, and a lot of people in this room with a lot of opportunities uh, to develop and move forward um, high-speed rail and conventional rail in not only the Midwest but all over the United States. It establishes a new partnership between the federal government, between states, and between Amtrak. The previous authorizing bill, which was passed in 1997, uh, had a significant provision in it. And that provision in the, in the bill, uh, the 1997 bill, required that at the end of the bill, Amtrak was to be self-sufficient and profitable. Uh, frankly, we tried and we, we failed at that miserably. Uh, passenger rail is not a profitable uh, enterprise. Uh, and, but the law of the land from 1997 until last fall was that inner city passenger rail should be profitable, that there should be no government role in funding the operation of inner city passenger trains. That all changed in the reauthorization bill which passed last fall. The bill implies that passenger rail is a valuable part of the, inner, of the nation's transportation system and is worthy of, of significant government investment, not only for capital, but for operating. Oops. Uh, it sets up a framework for us to enter into partnerships, deeper partnerships with our state partners. And what you see here are some of the things that we do, some of the things that we offer to our state partners. I think the most important thing in my mind is uh, that we have partnerships, relationships with the existing uh, freight railroads in the United States, the six class one carriers, several of which are, are in the room today. I see Tom Livingston from CSX, uh, Paul Nowicki I think from BNSF was here. I don't know if Paul is still here. Uh, and I think Hugh, there's Hugh Kiley from Norfolk Southern. We have contractual relationships to provide inner city uh, passenger rail service over the nation's freight railroads. Uh, and we offer them, we provide them indemnification. Uh, uh, we have insurance agreements in effect with them. And it is a valuable thing for our state partners to then approach us and have us work with the railroads. When we talk about the uh, 8 billion, or really the, the stimulus bill in general, what we say is that it really fulfills the, uh, the, um, the potential that was laid out in the reauthorization bill last fall, PREA, uh, because it provides these $8 billion really to our state partners to set them up to become uh, funding partners uh, to set up these high-speed rail corridors in the regional parts of the country. We can apply for this money. We're an eligible recipient of that. But if you dig deeply into the bill, you will, you will clearly understand that the bill was really set up to provide the $8 billion to our state partners. Uh, and I'm really excited about the opportunities that this bill is going to provide. As I think other speakers have said, uh, it is the bill directs the Federal Rail Administration, the FRA, uh, to write the regulations for distri distributing these funds, uh, and it required them to uh, release those regulations by June 17th, uh, which is two days from now. And FRA promised the White House that they would deliver those early. Uh, and I think the working deadline now is midnight tomorrow night. Isn't that right, George? <laughs> midnight on the 16th. Uh, what that means is that by tomorrow night or by Wednesday, the states will have in their hand a piece of paper showing them what the application guidelines are going to be for the $8 billion in high-speed rail money. Uh, the FRA would like to have um, the applications received by August from the states, and they would like to begin awarding money as soon as September, um, with money being spent as early as December. So this is real. It's going to happen. It's going to happen very, very quickly. And we are setting ourselves up to use our resources and our tools to help the state partners 
like the state of Illinois and others, to apply for this money, to spend it wisely, uh, to begin to develop a high-speed rail system in the United States. The stimulus bill also provided $1.3 billion in capital funding to Amtrak itself. Uh, the $1.3 billion, we, ha we have already applied to the Federal Road Administration for that money. They have approved more than 80% of our requests. Uh, so far, 52% of the money is to be spent on the Amtrak-owned infrastructure in the Northeast Corridor. 48% is to be spent off the Northeast Corridor. Uh, there's the grant application process for the $8 billion. Um, and this is what I think a lot of individuals in this room would like to, to talk about today. Uh, in the Northeast Corridor, we have a, a very good engineering staff. We own the railroad and we engineer it. Outside of the Northeast Corridor, we have a small engineering staff. Uh, and we are going to need a lot of outside help and support uh, to engineer the projects outside of the Northeast Corridor that we want to spend money on. We will look to HACIA and other organizations for help in, in managing those, those contracts and those awards uh, and those projects to develop not only the Amtrak projects but the inner city high speed rail system that the, uh, that the bill, the, the stimulus bill lays out. We have set aside, uh, as you see, a, a goal of minimum of 25% of the funds to be um, small, spent with small businesses and a minimum of 10% with DBEs. Uh, we've, we've got a, a criteria system in place that rewards contractors for working with DBEs and small businesses. Uh, and I'm hopeful and optimistic that the numbers are going to be much higher than this. There is information on our website about these processes, and I would encourage you, if you're all interested, to go and look at this. Every project of the 1.3 billion that we have applied for is listed on our website. It's broken down by category, it's broken down by state, uh, and there's um, updates constantly about the new projects that we were putting out for bid. And again, if you want to see me afterwards, you can get my card and I can help walk you through this process, or you can just go to Amtrak.com and look at that. Our procurement department uh, is going to be looking very carefully at this. Our inspector general's office has uh, got $5 million out of the stimulus bill to look at how we spend this money to make sure that we honor these commitments. It is an important part of what we want to do going forward. Uh, we're very excited about the opportunities that we face. Uh, as I stand here today, I know that in three years, inner city passenger rail in the United States is going to look very, very different than it does today. Uh, I've spent most of my adult life working on this. This is a really, really exciting time uh, for us. I thank you for this opportunity to be here today, and I don't know if you want me to stay up here for questions or... Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lang, for that very informative presentation. That includes our, concludes our presentation here this morning. However, I want to remind everyone that uh, should you so desire to take a look at them again or wish to uh, view them online, they will be available on our HACIA website. Uh, take a look right before you on the table. There are a number of cards. Our actual web address is located within there, in addition to other websites available regarding uh, further information on high-speed rail as well. Also, I want to remind everyone that uh, we took the liberty of uh, printing out and uh, actually developing, for any of you who are in need, uh, professional development hours. We have PDH certificates with your names on them at the front. Uh, if you haven't picked them up already, uh, please do so on your way out. And before we begin our Q&A and certainly our networking session, I do want to take the time here to recognize uh, a couple of individuals, but most noteworthy as well to our organi two organizations that work with HACIA in assisting us in uh, pulling together today's symposium. Uh, HACIA certainly uh, regards itself as a premier organization. However, that we always work in concert with a number of other organizations it hopes to sustain and support our overall mission. But these two organizations, many of them are individual members as well as companies, assisted us in pulling together symposium. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers and the American Council of Engineering Companies, ASCE and ACEC, who really helped us pull this off. Give them a round of applause, please. In addition, I, I want to recognize uh, the HACIA Professional Service Committee, um, who really worked hard to pull together a lot of the speakers and presenters, and 
and pull together the overall symposium today before you. And uh, I would like to acknowledge Mr. LaSalle Smith from SE3 LLC, Mr. Victor Avila from DBHMS, Mr. Herbert Berg from HBK Engineering, Mr. Moshin Javadi Bloom from Bloom Companies LLC, Mia Delgado from David Mason and Associates Inc., Ms. Rosalinda Pignato from Rosalinda's Interiors, and our two board members, Mr. Luis Collado from STL Architects and George Moreno from Civcon Services. Give them a round of applause as well. And of course, um, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize my staff for um, keeping me on track. I had to say that today, right? I was just dying to use that. I uh, want to acknowledge uh, our Associate Director, Gilbert Villegas, Jr. Um, he leads our efforts on behalf of HACIA's governmental affairs and ensuring our organization maintains its relationships with elected officials on all levels of government. Uh, in addition, Ms. Neda Cintron and Maria Esparza, I'm sure many of you spoke with those individuals regarding uh, when you were trying to register, and they uh, were here early this morning uh, greeting all of you as well. In addition to Ms. Lorena Flores, our administrative assistant, and Ms. Jackie Gomez and Juan Calajarano, who are also here with us today. Thank you very much for your help, team. Once again, uh, thank you to all of our board members who are joining us here today. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, in addition, thank you to CAN TV who is uh, here filming this entire event, and I understand will be broadcast um, at a later date. Um, I'm also advised that there might be some individuals from Fox News as well, so they may be seeing you on your way out with some questions. Uh, however, though, once again, I thank all of you for being with us today. Uh, it's certainly a very informative program. I'd like to move on now to any Q&A sessions uh, here that uh, any questions we might have from the audience. If so, there is an actual microphone in the center of our room. If you so desire to come on up there, uh, please do so freely. Uh, this is for Mr. Uh, Lang. What is the uh, what definition are you using of a small business? Is it twenty five percent of his contracts going small business? Uh, you had to you had to ask me a question. I don't know the answer to. So I, I I will defer to our website to define what small business is for us. But um, as I said in my remarks, this is very important for us to um, meet these commitments that we've laid out. Uh, the company takes this very very seriously. Uh, so if you want to trade cards afterwards, I can follow up with you, and if it's not on our website, then I'll definitely get you that information. Will there be a need for a new high-speed rail station built in any of the cities in the Midwest, primarily Chicago, St. Louis, that you see as part of this program? You want that? Uh, the, the current uh, thinking on this, and, and, and IDOT is, is here in the room, um, George Weber is, is at a table here uh, behind you. The current thinking is that this would, the high-speed rail service uh, that is being planned out and, and, and studied and hope, hope to be, we would hope to apply for the funding to, to implement, looks at uh, service over existing lines serving existing stations. I think in many cases, communities um, and cities are going to provide for major upgrades to existing stations, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, we're not looking at new stations. Uh, the state of Wisconsin, though, is looking at a new route altogether to Madison. We do not currently serve Madison, and uh, I think should they provide service between Milwaukee and Madison, they will need a new station. So. I think existing, existing routes with existing stations, except for where there's new routes altogether. Uh, for each or any one of you individuals, and thank you for being here, given the um, uh, unbelievable safety record uh, and uh, uninterrupted service of the suspended uh, transportation systems in Germany and Japan, uh, is it something that is being considered, uh, given that they have high-speed capacities, is it something that's being considered here as part of this high-speed rail uh, possibilities? Thank you. 
here, here in Illinois, we would define high-speed rail as 110 miles an hour. And to the degree that, that you could do more, I think we would explore that possibility. But, uh, but clearly, there are some limits that we would have on all these routes simply because of, uh, first of all, because of the federal rules at 150, and also the fact that when you use existing lines, you have to deal with crossings uh, and, and other traffic. I think one of the things that happen in Europe that allows them to go so much faster is that they have dedicated lines. They have, in many cases, and I think in most cases, uh, rail lines that just use the high-speed rail. We would, we would be using high-speed rail and freight. In, in particular, the systems in Germany uh, and Japan are suspended, and so there are no rail crossings, and they use uh, existing corridors, uh, roads, highways, utility, and, and rail. Yeah, so if we were going to go to something above 110 or even above 150, we would have to deal with those kind of issues where we have uh, an, an, any number. If you if you'd ride the Amtrak from Chicago to St. Louis, you'll see any number of grade crossings in these small communities out in the rural areas that um, right now we, we have the arms that protect the cars and the rails from hitting each other. But clearly, you know, you have to have some kind of mechanism uh, to protect the riders on the train. So, so those are the kind of issues you have to answer. We think we can deal with it at 110. To get to the next level will require, you know, a, a lot of additional engineering. Any other thoughts from any of the other panelists? Well, um, regarding magnetic, magnetic levitation, I think it's a technology that uh, sounds wonderful, and in, but in, in, in theory and, and when it's practiced, it's so incredible to put in place, uh, incredibly expensive to put in place, and so many requirements. Uh, that's it's proved really hard. And actually, you mentioned the, the track record. There was an accident in Germany. Uh, following that, um, even even in Germany, where that, that technology had been developed, they didn't opt for for, for that that technology because it was too expensive for them. So, so basically, it's way out there. <laughs> actually, I'm I'm speaking specifically of suspended, I'll, not I'll, not no, grade based, yeah. not uh, maglev. Yeah. Uh, the 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 two in Germany, the like three in Germany, and the and the two in Japan. So they are not grade-based uh, at all. They are not maglev. Uh, so I, I wasn't very clear. I hope that, that my question is clearer now. I'll, I'll actually take it. I've, I've seen your presentation. I've seen you speak before, and I, and I know of the service that, that you're talking about. The $8 billion that's in the stimulus bill for high-speed rail is, is very specific in terms of how it's supposed to be spent and how it's supposed to be obligated. And it's really a railroad bill. It is not looking at the kind of technology that your uh, company advocates for. It is a railroad bill. It actually requires the states to, s to sign memorandums of understandings with the freight railroads to plan this stuff out. It is, it is designed to be very quickly spent on the nation's inner city uh, corridors in partnership uh, with the states and with the freight railroads. The, the type of service that, that, that your company has, has studied and looked at uh, is not being studied and looked at by, I don't think, any other states, at least in terms of for, the, for applying for and spending this money. As, as bold ideas, I hope it's something that you will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions uh, which to be presented to the members of our panel this morning? Yes, sir. Hi. I, um, I had a quick question about um, a lot of the discussion today primarily focused on the high-speed rail link between, say, Chicago and St. Louis, and it was a lot of it was surface-focused. Um, clearly, you get a lot more demand and, and um, kind of attach itself to the larger scope of a nationalized transportation network if you link to the air hubs. Um, is there any plans to do that, or is any, how is that operated into so you're actually creating a, a larger, wider transportation network across the nation in, instead of just a small, localized area? Well, I guess what I would say is that Chicago is the hub for, for all these proposals, whether it's whether it's Chicago to St. Louis or Chicago to Milwaukee or Chicago to Detroit. Uh, and I think all the other states around us probably see uh, an ability to then build on uh, what we're proposing here in Illinois. So, for example, I heard the governor from Missouri just last week say he'd like to see a Kansas City to St. Louis high-speed rail, but he acknowledged that that didn't really make any sense unless the St. Louis to Chicago part, part was done as well. So I think as we go forward, 
uh, with what we're proposing here, uh, we could see that there could be add-ons to that. But clearly, the traditional place that we've had here in Chicago as the, as the hub will, will remain. I would just add to that that uh, currently um, four of our stations are actually at airports at BWI at Newark at uh, General Mitchell Field here in Milwaukee or just north of here in Milwaukee and also at Bob Hope Airport in Burbank and in fact I, I flew to uh, Burbank about two months ago and, and walked literally across the street and picked up one of our trains and took it into LA. So we do have four um, if not more uh, stops at airports. They're great stops for us. We like that opportunity. Our CEO, Joe Boardman, has a mantra for the, the company that we're safer, greener, healthier, and more connected. Uh, he wants as many of our stations as possible to be multimodal. Uh, and that's not just partnerships or connections with uh, buses or subways, but, but at airports. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, we certainly want to thank our panels. Uh, we have one more question in the back. Thank you uh, for uh, appearing to the panel, and I, I want to thank you for your t taking your time today. Uh, two questions. One is that uh, the gentleman from Spain, I wonder if you could meet with the CTA and maybe they could give us our money back every time they're <laughs> five minutes late. <laughs> but what I want to ask is, how many, I think somebody had a slide of something to the fact that there's like 20,000 uh, 20, jobs that will be produced or so. And I just wonder how many ancillary jobs would something like a high rail uh, corridor could? Ancillary, separate spin off jobs. Oh. Well, um, um, as I say, it's very hard to keep track of, of, of the actual jobs because there are so many companies that might work in fields related to. Um, to First, there are the jobs created by the industry itself, railway industry, where we have providers of seeds, of um, um, converters, all, all the electrical equipment, um, all, all those companies working for the industry itself. But then you have the, the companies that are attracted to a specific area because you have this connection. So this is another tier of, of jobs that are indirectly benefiting from having this uh, connection. So overall, it basically, um, uh, if you consider it, it's, there's a huge effect in, in, in jobs, too. It, there, it, though it's hard to measure. There are some studies that, that offer figures, but they vary. They, they are, of course, because of this is what I was mentioning. Some of them consider this broad specter. Others are limited to the industry itself. Does the gentleman from Illinois well, have any Yeah, idea? what I have is um, based on a formula that we have for the Class One railroads, a million dollars spent on rail improvements uh, will direct, will will provide uh, jobs for nine people. So if you say, well, what would two billion provide? Well, that's 18,000 direct jobs. Now, most of those are gonna go for people who are Teamsters that work for the railroad. So they're gonna be good paying union jobs. Uh, probably another 100 uh, would go for people who maintain the rails. Uh, and then we would say that for every million dollars, you get 45 secondary or spin-off jobs, people that work in restaurants or grocery stores, uh, things like that. So that would be on $2 billion, that would be 90,000 indirect jobs. So, so those are kind of the, the numbers we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we would certainly enjoyed all of your company today, and more importantly, though, we enjoyed the presentations from all of our presenters today. Let's give them a round of applause. We hope your time spent with us this morning was certainly informative, and hopefully you can come away here with a little clearer understanding in us making the case for high-speed rail. Um, on behalf of HACIA, um, all of our staff, as well as ASCE and ACEC, we thank you for joining us this morning. We look forward to uh, seeing you in the future, perhaps maybe with some projects that are directly related to high-speed rail for all of us to benefit in. Thank you for joining us.